Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Gene Convene Global Collaboratives webinar series around the theme of engineered gene drives and the state of the research. My name is Dave Obrachta. I'm a member of the Gene Convene Global Collaborative team and your host and moderator for this series of webinars focus on some of the technical aspects of the research and development of engineered gene drives, along with my colleague, Hector Komata. Before we get to today's speaker, let me tell you a little bit about Gene Convene Global Collaborative, tell you a little bit about this and upcoming webinar series, and then a bit about how we'll conduct today's seminar. So the Gene Convene Global Collaborative is an initiative within the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. And it has arisen from and, and, and is an extension of FNIH's long involvement in the vector-borne disease space. Gene Convene works to advance the safe, ethical, and rigorous exploration of gene drive and other genetic biocontrol technologies. It does this in a variety of ways. It tries to anticipate emerging issues, and to facilitate the development of guidance and best practices through consensus building. Gene Convene also seeks to offer accurate information, advice, technical support for the purposes of fostering responsible approaches to research and governance of gene drive and other genetic biocontrol technologies for public health. The potential of genetic biocontrol and gene drive technology specifically to contribute to the reduction and even the elimination of human malaria, for example, as well as other urgent public health challenges is substantial. The responsible exploration of these technologies is critical in order to see if in fact these technologies can fulfill their potential. So I encourage you to learn more about Gene Convene Global Collaborative. You can visit us at uh, the website fnih.org forward slash Gene Convene. And before I, we move on, let me also point you to the Gene Convene Virtual Institute. This is a component of the Gene Convene Global Collaborative. The Virtual Institute is a knowledge resource that aggregates, tracks, organizes, and shares uh, the latest about gene drive, from scholarship and research, to media reports, to policy and regulatory documents. The Virtual Institute is striving to create a resource where those interested in gene drive and genetic biocontrol can come and learn about what's happening and what has been happening. To further those, uh, to further aid the, those interested in genetic biocontrol and gene drive, the Virtual Institute publishes a weekly newsletter that notifi notifies subscribers of new scholarship, new media reports, etc., related to gene drive and genetic biocontrol. This research space of <clears throat> genetic biocontrol and gene drive is becoming increasingly active. Uh, there's been over 100 publications and even more media reports uh, in 2020 alone. There are important ongoing discussions and conversations concerning these technologies and their potential applications. The Virtual Institute can assist those interested in becoming and staying informed. So of course, I also uh, encourage you to follow the Gene Convene uh, on Twitter and Facebook. Let me say something now about this, our seminar series. This particular seminar series focuses on the technical aspects of uh, gene drive science and is intended to provide researchers an opportunity to share their latest results and to receive feedback and discussion from others. While this series is limited to six researchers in an ever-growing field of research, we'll be coming back to this technical theme in later webinar series, and we'll have an opportunity to hear from others who are doing interesting and important research. The webinar series following this one uh, will look at a different theme, and it will be on engineered gene drives, regulatory and policy considerations. We'll be able to provide more information about the specifics of this particular webinar series shortly, uh, but it'll be before the, the end of the year and should follow very shortly after this particular webinar series. In the future, uh, at the beginning of the year and beyond, we'll continue to offer uh, webinars around themes that, um, that relate to gene drive and, and uh, should help those interested in this topic to remain engaged in this particular topic. 
Let me say something about how we'll, we'll run this particular seminar today. Let me say that for any technical issues you might have during the course of the seminar, uh, we have two people, Tara and Dietria, from our FNIH event staff. They can be reached by email by uh, at events at fnih.org. So if you should experience anything that uh, that's giving you problems as a viewer and listener, you can contact them at that email address and they'll be monitoring that. The seminar today will be roughly 50 minutes. Uh, we have 90 minutes in total for our presentation and questions. Feel free to use the chat function to ask questions at any time during the seminar. And I encourage you to do that as questions arise in your mind, uh, please please, put them out there and, and they'll be addressed. We will address the questions at the end of the presentation, however. Um, and as I said, we'll, we'll run for about 90 minutes. Uh, and at the end of 90 minutes, if there are still some remaining questions, we'll handle those offline. The presentation is being recorded and we'll post the recording of this presentation on the Gene Convene Virtual Institute at the web address that you see below. Okay. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Omar Akbari from the University of California at San Diego. Omar is an associate professor in the cell and developmental biology section of the Division of Biological Science at UCSD. Omar is a highly creative and productive scientist who's been really making sub substantive contributions in a number of sectors of the gene drive space. And I want to mention a couple that are outside of the genetics that he'll talk about today. So just uh, for example, Omar was a member of the Lancet's Commission on Malaria Eradication, whose report was published last year and in which they identified six areas of promising innovation that could play important roles in malaria and elimination efforts, with gene drive being recognized as one of those promising innovations. An outcome, I'm sure, can be attributed to Omar's participation on that, on that commission. And a second, and certainly not the only remaining example of, of Omar's activity within this space beyond just the bench science, is Omar leading the drafting of what will be pub a publication in science very soon entitled Core Commitments for Field Trials of Gene Drive Organisms. This was a, an example of a consensus building and a soft governance effort led by Omar uh, concerning how these technologies uh, might be moved out into the field. So Omar is contributing far and wide and today you'll be hearing about the great genetics he has been doing. So good morning, Omar. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're grateful and eager to hear what you have to say. Uh, are you ready to go? Yes, uh, let me just get my slides up. Hold on a second. Okay, so I'm gonna give you the ball and then the floor will be yours. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Great, thank you. Uh, my slides are up, can you see them? Good, I, I, I can see it and I can hear you perfectly. So the floor is yours, enjoy. Great. Um, well, thanks. Thank you, David, for that great kind introduction and also for the invitation for uh, being part of this important webinar series. Um, before I begin, I also want to thank, you know, Tara, Dietria and Hector uh, behind the scenes for, you know, help organizing this, this webinar. Um, and I'm just very happy to be part of it. So I'm going to start off with just kind of a broad overview of you know, the, the problem that mosquitoes pose on humanity. And then I'm going to lead into some of the um, current practices uh, for mosquito control that are used today. And then I'm going to talk about the technologies that we are engineering that utilize advanced genetic control to impair the mosquito's abilities to transmit pathogens. And then, of course, I'm going to talk about gene drive. Um, I'll give a broad overview of the sort of the goals, the types, the mechanisms. Um, I'm gonna focus the talk on confinable homing drives because that's um, kind of what we're working toward. And I'll also lead into some future directions. And then the last part of the talk will describe some alternative techniques for advanced genetic control that are non-gene drive. And in particular, I'll talk about precision guided SIT, PGSIT. And, and I'll also provide some preliminary data of this technique um, showing our progress in mosquitoes. 
So I, I love to begin with this slide, and this is a slide from Bill Gates, and it really exemplifies how much of a problem mosquitoes pose on humanity. And just looking at this slide, you, you can see that, you know, mosquitoes kill more people on earth than any other animal. And the next closest thing is humans killing each other, and that's because we love going to war. So why are mosquitoes so deadly? And the reason they're so deadly is because they transmit so many different pathogens that can affect humans. Um, we all heard, have heard about malaria, dengue fever, West Nile, yellow fever, Zika virus, etc. cetera. Um, it's estimated that you know, half of the world's population is at risk of being infected by a mosquito-borne pathogen. If you just look at malaria, we have about 207 million cases per year and about 1,000 people dying every day. And those are children under the age of five, primarily. And if you, if you do the math, that equates to about a child dying every two minutes. Dengue fever, we have around 390 million infections per year and with about 50,000 or so deaths. Um, the, the main three genre of mosquitoes that transmit these pathogens are, are you know, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, which transmit the, the, the viruses you see here, and Anopheles gambi is the main uh, malaria vector in Africa. So how do we protect ourselves from mosquitoes? And really our first line of defense is to reduce contact. And we can do that with using a number of different technologies. We can use insecticides, we can use bed nets, we can use lures and traps. We can modify the environment. We understand where mosquitoes lay their eggs in standing water primarily. So if we can reduce their uh, prevalence of breeding sites, we can reduce population numbers in that way as well. We can use insecticides and larvicides to either kill adult mosquitoes or prevent larvae from maturing into adults. We can use pathogen removal drugs, things like artemisin, which are used today, um, that can sort of um, kill the parasites. And then we have genetic technologies. Um, for example, Oxitex technology, which, which was just approved this year for, for use in the United States and has been used effectively in, in many countries, including Brazil and Cayman Islands, et cetera. Um, and then we also have the Wolbachia approach for either population modification or population suppression. And the population suppression approach is also being used here in the United States, um, in California, actually, um, you know, through Verily. So I guess I want to say that, you know, while all of these different approaches are essential for any sort of sustained success for mosquito control and, and they, they need to be continued, um, they all have their issues. Repellents, bed nets, lures, and traps, they require continuous application and they need to be distributed to the people that, that need them and they need to be used properly. Modifying the environment, um, one could imagine, you know, depending on how the environment looks, that could result in drastic ecological implications and it's actually quite difficult to do. Um, insecticides and larvicides, these things are expensive. Um, mosquitoes have evolved re resistance in their short-term applications. So once the application's over, the mosquito population simply bounce right back. Pathogen removal drugs, um, again, these aren't 100% effective and there, there's been evidence of evolved resistance to them. And then the genetic technologies that are being used today are not completely sustainable. So what we need are, are new technologies that can be used alongside all these existing approaches to really combat these mosquito problems. I wanna point out that the uh, mosquito is, is what we call an obligate vector for pathogen transmission. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, a wild mosquito will, will bite an infected individual will take up the parasites or the viruses and then incubate them for a period of time and then go bite the next unlucky individual and transmit. So the real underlying question is how do we block this very, very simple chain of transmission from mosquito to human to mosquito to human? And, and really the holy grail is to develop effective vaccines. If we can vaccinate everybody for malaria, for dengue fever, Zika virus, et cetera, then we could, we could prevent you know, transmission in that way as well. But the truth is there's been tons of effort put into developing effective vaccines for the various vectored pathogens. And for, for most of them, there, there really is not an effective vaccine to date. An alternative approach is, is simply to 
engineered the mosquitoes to be unable to transmit the pathogens. And over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years, there's been some super exciting progress in terms of engineering mosquitoes to be unable to transmit pathogens. And, and this is, a, there's a few of my favorite examples that I always show listed here. And this is work that's led by Marcella Jacobs Arena and Tony James, in which they've engineered mosquitoes to be unable to transmit the plasmodium parasite, plasmodium falciparum. And there's also some, some work, um, again, by Tony James, in which they've engineered um, 80s mosquitoes to be unable to um, transmit dengue virus zero type two. So, you know, I knew about all this work and I thought it was super exciting. And I started my lab, you know, at UC Riverside in 2015. And it, it was kind of a exciting time and scary time at, that year, because it was exciting in that, you know, CRISPR, you know, had, had already been discovered and was already utilized in, in insects and, and was being used in mosquitoes at that time. And, and we were pioneering some of that work as well. So the CRISPR aspect of it was super exciting. I mean, everybody was talking about CRISPR and I think people still are now, but back then it was, it was just super exciting. But then it was also really scary because, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, the Zika virus pandemic, and, and everything you saw in the news had pictures like this that were just terrifying. And everybody, you know, was, was so concerned about it. And, and so, you know, um, this was shortly after I started my lab and, you know, I got a call from the press office at UC Riverside and they're like, hey, Omar, you know, we know you work on Aedes aegypti. Um, can we list you as a Zika virus expert? And I was like, yeah, I mean, why not? Um, I, I knew nothing about Zika virus, to be honest, but I, and, and, very, and very few people actually did. Um, and so I had to do a lot of research to, to learn about it and understand um, this virus. And and I was listed as a Zika virus expert. I was, I was fielding interviews from, from media and press and, and responding to them. And, and so, you know, it, this, this got me, um, you know, thinking a lot and, and, and learning a lot about Zika virus. And, and what I found was that, you know, it originated from Uganda. It was a flavivirus. It was about, you know, 10.8 10 KB. It was a single stranded positive sense RNA that had a single open reading frame. It encoded about, 10 different proteins um, that get processed. Um, and, and, the, and the genome had been sequenced already. And so, um, you know, leveraging some of the, the work that I did when I was with Bruce, Bruce Hay at Caltech, you know, I was, I was doing a lot of work to try to build Medea. And, and I, I, was, I learned how to engineer microRNAs to give phenotypes in flies and also in mosquitoes. Um, and so I thought, well, why don't we just try you know, engineering a synthetic cluster of microRNAs to target the Zika viral genome in conserved locations to hit as many of these essential genes as possible, both structural and non-structural proteins. So we designed this system here. It's very simple. It uses a carboxypeptidase promoter that gets active in the midgut in response to a blood mill, and then it expresses this polycystronic array of microRNAs, each of which targets a different position on the Zika viral genome, and 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 then you know, we, we, we made the transgene, we, we, we engineered the mosquitoes, and then we, in collaboration with Chen Hong Chen at NHRI and Prasad Pradhakar um, and Jean Bernard Dishman at CSIRO, we basically did the Zika viral challenge assays. Um, they did that work. And essentially what they found was they looked, they looked at um, transmission. So they, they took these transgenic mosquitoes and they infected them uh, with Zika virus, and then they looked for transmission of Zika virus in their saliva. And what they found was these homozygous mosquitoes were essentially unable to transmit the, the Zika virus. So that was really exciting. And then, you know, we, we moved on from that work and, you know, there, there was, I showed you an example of, of, of work done prior where they used RNAi to disrupt uh, dengue serotype two. But you know, dengue virus actually has multiple serotypes, and many of these serotypes actually coexist at the same locations. Um, and so, you 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 would want a mosquito that's protected from like, like from all serotypes if possible. And so, you know, there was some there was a paper that came out by um, James Crow at Vanderbilt, and in which James actually found a um, broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibody that was found in humans that can protect against all four serotypes of dengue. And so I reached out to James and I was like, you know, it would be great if we can express this in mosquitoes. And, and he was like, yeah, sure, let's collaborate. And so we, we determined the sequence of that. 
and we engineered it to be a single chain antibody. We expressed it from carboxypeptidase, made transgenic mosquitoes, and again, in collaboration with Prasad and Chen Hong, um, did the uh, challenge assays. And this time we tested all four serotypes. And what we look for is um, infection by looking at the midgut, and, and then dissemination by looking at the carcass, and then transmission looking at the saliva. And what they found was that homozygous mosquitoes, again, were unable to transmit um, any of these different serotypes of dengue virus if you look at the saliva here. So if you, if you think about these results and the last couple slides before these, um, these last four slides basically, um, what these observations reveal is that we have this power to completely um, engineer the mosquito immune system and prevent them from transmitting these very dangerous pathogens like malaria, dengue, and Zika virus. So, you know, if we, if we can do that, why don't we just, you know, take these mosquitoes that we've engineered, you know, and just release them into the wild population? And the hypothesis would be that, you know, if they're unable to transmit, then as they spread, you'd get less human disease as you release them. And this is kind of how one might imagine this, you know, and, and what one would want to happen is, is you have a factory where you take these mosquitoes that you've engineered that are homozygous, you, you raise them in mass, you release them into wild disease transmitting populations. And over time, they spread those genes into these wild populations, converting those pathogen transmission, transmitting mosquitoes into um, you know, mosquitoes that cannot transmit. And eventually the goal would be at some point in time, everybody in the population will be unable to transmit pathogens and the problem will be solved. Well, you know, the grand challenge here, which, which has been the grand challenge for many, many years, I mean, this, this idea of population replacement is not new. It's, it's been around for quite a long time. But the, the challenge here is that, you know, if you release these genes and these, these mosquitoes into the population that have these genes, um, the, the question is, how are you going to get them to, to spread into the wild population and take over? Um, and the problem here is that these genes that confer pathogen resistance that we put into the mosquito um, also result in a fitness cost to the carriers. So those mosquitoes are not as fit as wild mosquitoes. They're not gonna produce as many offspring. They're not gonna survive as long. They've, they've been reared in a laboratory. And so how are, they gonna, how are they gonna compete with these wild disease transmitting populations? And the answer is that they're not. And so the solution to this problem is simply to link these genes for pathogen resistance with a gene drive system. And gene drive systems, th there's a number of different kinds, but they have this in inherent ability to spread in a population, even if they decrease the fitness of the animals in which they reside. So, you know, I've been working in this space for quite a long time since, you know, I, I work with Bruce and, and we actually built a number of different gene drive systems. And the first one that I worked on was the Medea system, which was a low threshold invasive drive mechanism for airwide population replacement. And we had a few papers that followed Chen Hong's original paper on Medea. And I have to say that, you know, while working on that system and, and seeing that you can bias transmission from females, you know, when you normally would ex expect 50% of the progeny to receive your gene and 100% receive them generation after generation, um, Pretty much forever. I, I mean, you get fixated on gene drive after that, and that's what happened to me. Um, and then, you know, we followed on with with that work, and we built a, a toxin antidote system, which we which which was an, the first underdominant system that was that was built, um, which we called Udmel, and that actually was a high threshold reversible drive system. And then we also um, designed another system, which we called reciprocal chromosomal translocations, and this is also a high threshold drive system. And that system is, is super stable and, um, and, and not really susceptible to any resistant alleles. So it's a really um, safe, stable system that can be used for population replacement. And, and all those papers were published in collaboration with Bruce. Um, and then this year we came out with another paper which, which we called Engineered Reproductively Isolated Species. And we worked on this system for about two and a half years um, to get to this point. And, um, I'm not going to talk about that because, you know, Michael Spansky has a similar system that he's going to talk about in a few weeks. So I would highly recommend you, you watch his talk. And, and then 
Uh, we've also been working in the you know, CRISPR homing-based gene drives, and we have several papers in this area, including one in mosquitoes. Um, and today, what I'm going to talk about is you know, the, the development of a confinable CRISPR homing drive in Aedes aegypti and our progress toward that and some future directions. And then I'll lead into um, PGSIT. So I wanted to point out that you know, um, CRISPR-Cas9 has really accelerated the development of gene drives. But prior to CRISPR-Cas9, you know, gene drives were, were, were being built by many labs. And there are many different mechanisms and types. And, and really, you know, um, the, the idea of a homing-based gene drive was, was, was first articulated by Austin Burt. And, and there was a, a number of papers that, have come, that had come out prior, after Austin Burt had his original paper. Um, that used different kind of nucleases to create homing-based gene drives. And, and at the time, they were using things like talins or zinc finger nucleases that were engineerable nucleases that one could use. And, and they were showing some, some progress also in mosquitoes and those. And, and when CRISPR-Cas9 came out, you know, it was, it was an obvious uh, transition to using uh, that system for a homing drive. And, and the way that works, it's, it's, it's very simple. Um, essentially what one does is they take Cas9, the, the nuclease and a guide RNA, which is gonna direct the nuclease and a cargo gene, which could be your anti-malarial effector gene or your anti-dengue effector gene. You link all those together in the, in, in the genome of a mosquito and you position them opposite their target site. And so what you want to happen is you want the Cas9 guide RNA to cut that target site opposite, make a double-stranded break that will get repaired via homology-directed repair, copying over the gene drive, which would be the Cas9 guide RNA cargo. And so what that does is it basically converts a heterozygote to a homozygote. And if that individual mates to a wild-type mosquito, then the progeny will be converted as well, becoming homozygotes. And then that just that process just continues on and on until you can get fixation in a population. Of course, there's nuances to this, and there's fitness cost, and there's resistant alleles that have been articulated um, that can sort of you know impair this ability a bit. But but in general, this is the the, the mechanism. And and I want to point out that there's there's really two big uh, approaches for for using um, this. The the first one is population modification kind of gene drives. And the idea is you can release a small um, number of individuals into a population and they'll spread to fixation. And depending on how, how good your drive works, if it's a perfect drive, in principle, a single organism can spread a, a trait throughout an entire population. Um, and ecologically for this approach, you know, the, the population is gonna remain at the end um, it's going to persist, but it, it will be no longer able to transmit pathogens. The, the second kind of system that's, been, that's being developed is a population suppression kind of gene drive. And in this, you, you would release a small number of individuals and they would spread to a point at which they reach an un unstable equilibria, and then the population would decline and crash. And there's a couple of different ways of designing these. Um, the systems that are being designed now target genes important for female viability or fertility or sex determination. And the idea is that once you reach this fixation point, all of your females are sterile or all your females are dead and the population declines. And, and ecologically for this kind of system, the population is going, to, um, is going to crash once it's eradicated. So population will no longer exist. So, you know, these two categories of gene drives, um, there's been a lot of discussion about these and, and there's potential issues that have been raised in, in many papers. And one of the big ones is that, you know, depending on how it's designed, if it's a linked drive system where the cast line gathering are linked, these things can be very invasive and spread beyond borders, um, which makes them somewhat uncontrollable and also non-reversible. Uh, in that you would need to release an alternative system to, to remove it. Um, and we had a paper that came out in collaboration with Ethan Beer last week in Molecular Cell, which described two such countermeasures, an eraser and, a, and any chaser. So you can read more about those there. And those are actually quite effective countermeasures. Um, and you know, because of these inherent issues, it, it makes it difficult to measure the risks. And then you know it opens up the question of, of whether these are actually regulatable, 
and, and what would be the unintended consequences and would the public accept these? So these are just some ongoing discussions that are happening um, now. And we have a paper here that I've, uh, we've discussed these in a bunch of our papers, but I've, there's a paper here that describes some of the unintended consequences that could happen with a population uh, replacement strategy. So you can read more there. Um, so a potential solution to some of these problems, at least in the immediate term, would be to, instead of designing these things to be sort of um, invasive, one would simply make them self-limiting. And self-limiting in that you'd have to do more releases, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't get away with just a single release, you'd have to do multiple releases, and here's 10 releases, for example, and they would spread uh, into a population for a period of time, and then, and then they would fall out. And this, while this requires a lot more effort, it gives all these desired features that would make the system controllable, confinable, reversible, which makes it safe. And, and I'll show you some data that, that, that indicates that this could actually be quite an effective approach, at least for you know, the first demonstrations of gene drives in the field. So you know, one simple way of converting a, a gene drive that can spread you know, from a small population would be, would be to simply unleak unlink the Cas9 from the drive. So, and that would be um, to, by developing split gene drives as pictured here. So the guide RNA and the effector would be on a different chromosome than the Cas9, and you would cross them together to get the um, transmission bias. So, you know, we, um, we, we, we went back and we tried to basically build uh, these split drive systems in Aedes aegypti, which is the major uh, dengue, Zika, uh, yellow fever vector. And, and to do that, we had to first define a bunch of the components because unfortunately uh, the tools were not there in this species. So we had to go back and develop all the tools and I'll talk about how we did that. So some of the things that we needed to build this system were we needed germline Cas9 expression. So we had to define promoters that express Cas9 in the germline. And then we also needed uh, polymerase three promoters that we can use to express our guide RNA. So we had to define those. So going back to some work um, that I did when I was in, in Bruce's lab um, in collaboration with uh, Philippos Papathanos, who's now at, in Israel, we back then defined a bunch of promoters that express in the germline in Aedes aegypti. Um, and these promoters um, expressed both in the um, female germline quite robustly and deposited into the oocyte but also exuprentia also expressed in the male germline. So what we did is we took those promoters and we essentially built these transgenes that, um, you know, using each of those promoters to drive expression of Cas9, and then we encoded a T2A GFP, and we had a, a marker as well. These are piggyback transgene. We inserted them in, got transgenic lines, and then looked at their ovaries. So these are ovaries here, and you could see very nice GFP expression in the ovaries for each of these um, as compared to wild type indicating that we're getting expression in the germline. And, and then once we got those, you know, we wanted to test whether the Cas9 actually works and is effective. And so what we did is we, um, we targeted a bunch of phenotypic genes. So we designed guide RNAs, we in vitro transcribed them, and then we injected just the guide RNAs into embryos that were derived from the, the mothers that, were, that expressed the Cas9. So the Cas9 came from the, from the genome, and what we did, what we found was we were able to get really robust phenotypes when we did that. So here are just some examples of some of the phenotypes we got um, when we targeted, you know, KH, yellow, and white, or ebony. We got really beautiful looking mosquitoes. And if we targeted yellow, we also got um, yellow looking eggs. And then we also targeted some developmental genes, some Hox genes that are important for anterior development in, in the mosquito. And, and we targeted, for example, deformed or synoculus, we got what looked like three eye mosquitoes. They had you know, one eye, two eye, three eyes. And here's another one, one, two, three eyes. Um, these, didn't, these didn't survive, but they, they created these really nice phenotypes. And then vestigial, which is important for wing development. We, we had mosquitoes come off that you know, couldn't fly, had malformed wings. So this kind of told us that we had, you know, the Cas9 lines are working quite well. And then we took this a step further and we injected combinations of guide RNAs into those embryos and, and we, ge we generated uh, double and triple mutants. Um, and I love to show these mosquitoes to people when they come into our lab because we have, 
we still have these as homozygous lines and they just look like anybody that's worked with Aedes aegypti, if you see these, they, they just, they can't believe they're actually Aedes aegypti because they're just, they look like, you know, mutant mosquitoes, which they are. Um, so in any case, we got um, Cas9 lines that worked really well. Um, and the next thing we needed to do was to define polymerase three promoters. So to do that, what we did is we, we built um, this construct here that had, you know, in this new genome assembly, there were six different U6 promoters or U6 genes that were found. So we, we defined the promoters from each of those and we used them to drive expression of a guide RNA that targeted the white gene, which gives you that really nice uh, white eye phenotype when targeted. And so we have this transgene and we just injected the transgene into the embryos from these exu um, Cas9 mothers that are depositing Cas9. And then we looked at the um, generation zero um, mutation rates. And what we found was four of these promoters actually generated pretty good rates of mosaicism, which were mosaic eye mutants. And then what we did is we, um, we, uh, we could cross these to um, uh, a mutant line and look to see if there are mutations in the germline. And what we found were we also, we also got really nice rates of mutations in the germline. So we were, we were mutating uh, the cells in the eye somatically and also in the germline. That was great. So the next step was to, um, using the same construct, we actually got transgenic lines from these injections. So we have GFP integrated. Then we took those and we crossed them back to Cas9, Cas9 mothers. And then we looked at the trans-tetrazygous progeny to see if they had mutations in their eyes. And in fact, they did. And depending on the promoter we used, we used two different Cas9 promoters, either ubiquitin Cas9 or XU Cas9. We got really high rates of somatic uh, mosaicism from U6, B, and C, almost 100%, which was really great. So, so now that we've defined our components, we defined our germline Cas9 expressing uh, promoters, we defined uh, promoters to, to design our guide RNA. We also, we also defined a really nice guide RNA that works really well targeting the white gene. We put those together and built split drives. So we use that guide RNA that targets white and we inserted it with a marker into its target site in the white gene. And then we could just simply cross the Cas9 and look for um, homing efficiencies and the trans heterozygotes. So um, this system was really, it was a really, really nice assay because since we targeted this I phenotypic gene, um, we were able to score, um, you know, uh, the rates at which we have mutations and also the rates of inheritance because we can look for uh, the RFP in the eyes, which is linked to the guide RNA. And the Cas9 had a body RFP, which you can't see here, but it was a different marker. So we can, we can track everything um, and, and measure homing efficiencies and also measure cleavage efficiencies by looking at all these various phenotypes. And so, you know, just to summarize kind of what we found in, in this paper, um, from trans heterozygous females, we found that we could get homing rates um, that averaged about 84%. And you would expect it to be 50% if it's transmitting medialianly. And our cleavage efficiency was 100%. So um, by targeting this, this white gene, everybody, and the next generation had either mosaic or completely white eyes, um, which was really great. Um, and, and the transmission efficiency was, was pretty decent in females. And in males, we had some transmission bias, um, but nowhere near as good as it was in females. So what we then did is we, we kind of, we did a bunch of fitness measurements to look for, you know, fecundity, longevity, um, uh, a few other things and, and, and use that information to plug into mathematical models to predict how the system would behave if it were released into a population. And this was work that was done in collaboration with John Marshall at UC Berkeley. And what John modeled was, you know, 10 releases of homozygous males at a one-to-one -one total population size. And, and that release, you know, while it's high, it's comparable to what people do for SIT. You know, SIT, they'll often do like a 20 to one release every, gen every generation, but this is a one to one release only for 10 generations, okay? And so 
what you see here is these lines that should indicate the different releases. So we have 10 releases here, and in, in red is your, your drive allele. So the drive allele goes to near fixation at 97%, have at least one copy, and they persist like that above 85% for three years. And if you look at a neighboring population, if you assume a 1% migration rate, this drive does not, um, does not spread and fix into that population. So it's confinable. If you compare that to just releasing a refractory gene, so if you take a refractory gene with a, with a small fitness cost and you release it into a population 10 times at one to one, it goes up and then it rapidly falls down. It also doesn't go into neighboring population, but it doesn't, doesn't maintain itself at high frequency like the split drive does. If you compare it to a linked homing gene drive, so like the invasive kind, and you, you plug in the same parameters that were put into this, um, essentially, and instead you do a single release at a one-to-one -one frequency, it spreads, um, it doesn't get as high because you don't release as many, and then it kind of starts to fall out because of the um, resistant alleles that are generated. And then with a 1% migration rate, it actually migrates over into neighboring population, which gets up to 67%. So I think this is not ideal. Um, so, you know, we believe this system is, is ready to be linked to an, an infector. So kind of in summary of our confinable uh, drive system, you know, we've, I've, I've described to you that we've engineered Zika and dengue resistant mosquitoes. We developed highly functional germline cast iron lines. We characterize you sick promoters. We developed functional split drives in Aes aegypti with average homing efficiencies of 84% and we, we demonstrated drive stability um, over multiple generations. Kind of some pending experiments for this system is to, to do long-term population cage studies and link effectors to the drive. And then, and then you know, we also are, are moving on to, to, to generating drives that are more evolutionarily stable. And to do that, um, in the last, within the last few weeks, we had two papers that came out on BioArchive and one of them we has a system that we call Homer, which we which we named, you know, um, after the the, the Greek uh, poet that that wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, just to keep in line with all the um, the previous drives that are named after um, Greek philosophers and uh, like Medea and Simile, for example. And and there's another paper in collaboration with our lab and Ethan Beer's lab that describes a very similar system, sim basically the same system as Homer targeting a bunch of different um, essential genes. So we had, we got these systems to work. Um, but for the purposes of this talk and kind of a joke in the lab, we call, we also call the system Homer, um, which you can think about Homer Simpson. And so I'm gonna keep that for the theme of this talk, just so you never forget uh, the, the, the name Homer. All right. So what is Homer and how does it work? And, and really it's, it's Homer because it uses home and rescue um, uh, as opposed to what Bruce talked about last week, which is cleave and rescue. Um, there was no homing involved, it was just cleaving. This actually has homing involved. And so to develop Homer, what we did is we targeted a gene in flies called polymerase gamma 35, which is required for the replication and repair of mitochondrial DNA. And what we did is we designed a, two different guide RNAs, guide RNA1, guide RNA2, that target the three prime end of this gene. And then we crossed those guide RNAs that are genetically encoded to two different Cas9 lines, actin 5C Cas9, which kind of is, is in the germline, also in somatic cells, and ligase for mutant background, and then also to nanos Cas9. And what we found was guide RNA1, actually, when you cross the actin 5C Cas9, kills everybody whereas guide RNA2 only kills the males and the females survive. And if you cross the nanos Cas9 female, then guide RNA1 kills everybody and guide RNA2, you know, um, it, it, it doesn't work as well. So I guess the point here is that I want to make is, is that, you know, um, these two guide RNAs are inserted at the exact same location in the genome and they use the same promoter and they're crossed to the same Cas9 lines, but one works better than the other. So not all God RNAs are created equal. And I think that's really important message for gene drive developers. You should test your guide RNA because if your guide RNA is not very good, your gene drive is not gonna be very good. Okay, so guide RNA um, one worked really well, killed everybody. And the way it kills everybody is that when you have maternal deposition of Cas9 
and Guy Darnay's or, or just Cas9 and inherit Guy Darnay's, what you get is you get throughout development of the animal, you get a bunch of things happening in the cells, right? You can get cells with wild type that, that are not mutated or, or, or sorry, not, um, uh, not mutated. You can get cells that, that have uh, two mutations in the target gene. Um, you can get cells with a resistant allele and this continues throughout development. But when you're targeting the central gene, if you just create enough of those events that knock out the gene function, then you get you can get complete penetrance of a lethal phenotype, and we term this system this approach um, uh, biallelic lethal mosaicism. In our paper, uh, when we first described it um, with PGSIT, and I'll come back to that at, at the end of the talk. Okay, so to develop Homer, we targeted this gene polymerase gamma. We had two guides that targeted the three prime end here. Oops, um, picture there, and we recoded the codons that 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 you know, after that, so they were not recognized. So this is what the homers look like. We have our, um, our recoded target sites there. We use an external three prime UTR to prevent recombination with the, uh, with the uh, opposite allele. We had a U6 guide RNA, and then we had our, um, our marker. So we built these as split drives. And then what we did is we took um, het uh, het trans heterozygous females that had Cas9 and the homer system or trans heterozygous males, and we crossed those to wild type, and then we looked at transmission bias. And what we found was, you know, if we cross them to nanos, VASA, ubiquitin, or actin, we got almost 100% transmission from trans heterozygous females. It was like 99.9%. And then from males, it, was, it, was, it wasn't as high, but it, we did get some bias. And we estimated the homing rate to be around 90% and a killing rate of 10%. And um, the way we did that is we actually counted embryo to adult and we looked at if there was embryos that were dying that didn't inherit. Um, but in any case, we had, a, we had about 90% homing efficiency. So, and then what we did is we were interested to see what would happen in a population. And, and we, were, we, were not so, we, we weren't as interested to see if it would spread into a population. We wanted to see if resistant alleles could, could hinder the spread because we're targeting an essential gene. And if you mutate it, then you're, you're, you know, you're going you're gonna to have a fitness problem. So what we did is we set up the Homer drive in a Cas9 homozygous background, and we released um, homozygous Homer cross to wild type. And so in the G0 generation, everybody here is heterozygous or, or trans heterozygous, oh, sorry, heterozygous for the drive and homozygous for the Cas9. And then, you know, we can track over generations. And what we found was, you know, um, it, it stayed at um, fixation, except in generation two and generation three, we had a few individuals that came out that had white eyes, so they lost the, the drive allele. And, and then we took those and sequenced them and they had, and, and indeed they had functional resistant alleles, but these individuals were not healthy. We cannot propagate them, they were sterile, so they didn't, they didn't contribute to the next generation. So they kind of fell out of the population and then we never saw them again. And then we did another experiment um, to show that, you know, Homer spreads in a Cas9 dependent manner. And essentially to do this, we crossed um, homozygous Homer, um, uh, 50, 50 males that are homozygous Homer, homozygous Cas9, plus 50 males that are wild type, homozygous Cas9, um, to, um, you know, females that are just wild type and Cas9. And then what we found was, you know, the Homer um, spreads to fixation. And these, these drives have been, we have more generations here that I didn't show, but we have um, these drives at fixation. And, and if you just release the Homer without Cas9, it, it goes up a little bit and then it kind of falls down and it falls out of the population. So, um, and then in collaboration with John Marshall, we did some um, modeling that would compare how the system would behave in comparison to um, contemporary drive systems like cleaver and tear, which you heard a lot about last week with Bruce, with Bruce. Um, and we looked at Homer and we looked at a split drive that, that doesn't target an essential gene. And what you find is Homer actually outperforms all these drives if you release at 25% uh, frequency. And the reason it does that is because, you know, cleaver and tear kill half their progeny from heterozygous females, whereas Homer, you know, converts them and spreads. So it spreads a little faster. And then it also um, can handle, you know, um, if you look at these heat maps, which depict drive efficacy, um, comparing fitness and transmission rates, you can see that 
it can handle, um, you can release less of them and, and the, um, they can handle more of a fitness cost. So this red here shows um, drive efficacy to fixation. So red means fixation um, at generation 20. And so Homer actually performs um, better than these other systems. And, and the reason why is because again, the, the, the mechanism of action. So when you have a heterozygous female that mates to wild type male, there's three main outcomes that are gonna happen. You're gonna get homing so in the germline, you're gonna get conversion, or you're gonna get cleavage, or you're gonna get you know, maternal transmission, and you're gonna get cleavage of, of both alleles. And when this happens, you get lethality because you're targeting an essential gene. And, and when, when you get just cleavage of the opposite allele, you get rescue. So these little green dots are rescue. So these individuals are unaffected because we're targeting an essential gene that's haplosufficient. So providing one copy of the rescue actually is sufficient for these to survive. So while you can, you can keep these resistant alleles in the population, when they, when they mate with each other and this happens, they, they fall out of the population. All right, so take home from Homer is that, you know, we developed a Homer drive that can result in 99% transmission from females. Um, it's very important to select a highly functional guide RNA for Homer drive and probably for, for, for gene drive in general. Drive resistant alleles can be generated in the population cage experiments for Homer, but they did not impede the spread of the drive. And the simplistic design of Homer should enable development in a wide range of species um, including mosquitoes. So that said, I'm going to move on to the last part of my talk today. Have a, have some time left. I'm going to talk about sterile insect technique and PGSIT. And so the idea of sterile insect technique is simple. It's you mass rear your insect, you, you separate the males from females, you irradiate the males, you deploy the males, the males mate with wild females, population declines. This is a very successful system that has been used um, in many insects, including the screw room, the Mexican fruit fly, the med fly, for example. Some of the limitations of this is that irradiation can reduce the fitness of the released males. This does not work well for mosquitoes because they're very fragile and it puts too much of a fitness cost on them. And then you, and, and in most of these systems, you, you must release adults, which makes it difficult to scale um, the system. So like existing SIT systems kind of look like this. You have a factory where you raise your insects, then you separate your males from females, then you manually go out and release your males and they find the females. And this requires you to build factories kind of everywhere to enable the, the manual release of the adult males because you can't transport them very far. They're very fragile, not too durable. So what we want to do is we want to try to sort of reinvent this and come up with an approach that would enable the development of one factory where we can do a genetic cross in the factory, generate eggs that then can be deployed around the world and only hatch as a sterile male. So to do this, we came up with this idea of targeting essential genes for female viability or male fertility. And so in flies, we targeted the sex determination pathway. We targeted um, sex lethal, tra, and double sex. And then for male fertility, we targeted beta tubulin 85D, which is um, a sperm specific tubulin important for my, my, microtubule function. So the way we did this is we, we had Cas9 lines. This is in flies again. And we designed guide RNAs that targeted each of these genes individually. We homozygose these flies, we crossed them, and we, we looked at the outcome. And so here's some data where we took, you know, if you take um, your homozygous guide RNA that targets sex lethal, you cross the male, cross the wild type female, you don't get any um, bias in sex ratios. Or if you take the, the Cas9 female to wild type male, no bias. But if you cross the sex lethal guide RNA homozygous males to nanos Cas9 females that are homozygous, 100% um, of your progeny are sterile males. All the females are dead, 100%. And if you cross to homozygous tra, all your females are converted into intersex males, which are sterile. Or double sex, all your females are converted to intersex males, which are sterile. Or beta tubulin, all your females are fine. All your males are converted into sterile males. And it actually didn't matter for this cross if you crossed um, male parent that had the guide RNA to female Cas9, or if you crossed male Cas9 to female guide RNA. We had the same data. These are like almost mirror images of each other, which was really amazing. And then it, we also tested other Cas9s and got the same results. So these are the kind of the outcomes from, 
If you target sex lethal, you get all dead females. If you target tron double sex, 100% intersexes, beta tubulin, 100% sterile males. So once we had those individual guide RNA data, what we did then is we combined them. So we combined um, beta tubulin with sex lethal or beta tubulin with tra or beta tubulin double sex. So we had these double guide RNA expressing lines. We then crossed them to Cas9. So we had male double guide RNA beta tubulin sex lethal to nanos Cas9 homozygotes. And what we found was 100% of the progeny were sterile males. And if we did beta tubulin tra, 100% of their progeny were either sterile males or sterile intersex females. And, and if we double sex, same thing. And it didn't matter if we used different Cas9 lines, we got the same results. Or if we crossed in the opposite direction, same results. The phenotypes were 100% penetrant. So this was really amazing. And this is what the phenotypes look like. Um, so these are wild type male and female. Um, these are um, the double guide RNA mutating sex lethal and beta tubulin. All, most of the, in the females die as, as pupae. Um, if you target beta tubulin and tra, you actually, these are actually females here. They look like males, but they're females. And these females actually have sex combs, which are something only males have um, for tra. And if you target double sex and beta tubulin, you also get all intersex females. They're sterile. They don't have the sex combs and they look more like females. They're bigger but they have male genitalia. Okay, and then we, you know, in this paper, we, we just first described lethal biologic mosaicism. And the idea is that when you have maternal deposition of Cas9 and you inherit a guide RNA, you get all these outcomes during development, which can result in these phenotypes. If you use a stronger Cas9, you can get um, even more phenotypes. And if you inherit the Cas9 and guide RNA, you get expression throughout development, as well as maternal deposition and you can get all these different phenotypes happening. So um, moving on, um, you know, we developed this in flies and we've also been working to develop an agricultural crop pests and also in mosquitoes. We've been working at Aedes aegypti. And the nice thing about mosquitoes, especially Aedes aegypti, um, is that many mosquitoes actually go through diapause so you can actually store eggs and there's papers in Egypt that show you can store the eggs in the lab for up to five years. We haven't done that. We've done, we've done a year pretty, pretty well, but not five years, but five years is doable to, according to some papers. But basically what we do is you take Cas9 lines, you cross it to guide RNA lines that express, you know, a guide that targets a gene important for female viability and a gene important for male fertility. You cross them and then you can take the eggs, store them, and then simply deploy them when you want into a population. And I'm picturing an island here because I think this is really a great approach to first try on an island to see if we can get elimination of a population simply by deploying eggs. The nice thing about this system is it's logistically scalable. It's environmentally friendly. It's evolutionarily stable. And the, way, the reason I say that is because you're, you, the components are separate. Cas9 separated from the guide RNA. You cross them together. The outcome is a dead end. They're sterile males. And even if you do get a couple females or a couple non-sterile males, you're gonna release them amongst all sterile males. So it's, they're not gonna really take over. That makes the system very safe, effective, and controllable. And so what have we done? This is some, some data we're working to write up at the moment. I'm, I'm just showing you know summary, but we've been able to sterilize 100% males. We've been able to convert 100% of females into intersex females. This is what intersex females look like. Here's a wild type male, wild type female. Intersex actually have um, this, this, this longer Malpighian tubule, and they also have um, uh, uh, they also have their genitalia are also um, disrupted and they're sterile. We've also been able to um, convert females into 100% flightless females by targeting certain genes, and I'll show you what that looks like here. So. This is a cross between a Cas9 and a guide RNA that targets a gene important for female flight. All the females that come off from this because the Cas9 and the guide RNA are homozygous look like this. Many of them can't come out of their pupil cases, but when they do come out of their pupil cases, they sit on the surface of the water because their wings are not strong enough for them to fly. And they can move their wings around. So we move them off and put them here. You can see them moving their wings around but they just can't, they just can't fly. 
Um, interesting thing is the males that come off are completely fine. They can fly, they can mate, they can reproduce perfectly fine. Um, here's, here's me trying to poke them to, to get them to fly. They won't fly. Um, so we're super excited about this, this phenotype. Um, one, these females actually can still blood meat, blood feed. So if you put your hand in there when they're ready, they, they'll try to take blood and they'll bite you. Um, but if we think in the wild, these will not survive. They, they will, it's very unlikely they'll be able to, to bite an infected individual and then bite and then transmit. So we think this could be a really viable approach to controlling mosquitoes in general. Um, and so we're really excited about this, this idea as well. Okay, so, you know, going forward, um, you know, we're going to continue developing antipathogen effectors. I think this is a really important area for anybody working on population modification gene drives. Uh, we have a paper, we, we, we described a CRISPR RNA targeting system in mosquitoes. And so we want to try moving that over, or sorry, in flies, we want to try moving that over into mosquitoes. And, you know, the next talk is going to be by George Christopoulos, who's going to talk a lot about, um, you know, this idea of uh, creating disease, mosquitoes that cannot transmit um, pathogens. So I think a lot of more work needs to go into this concept. Um, we're gonna keep working on developing confinable gene drives in mosquitoes. We wanna link effectors to split drives. We wanna develop Homer systems, which are a little more evolutionarily stable in mosquitoes. And of course, we wanna finish up our PGSIT and, and hopefully get some field trials of, of that system. Um, I just want to sort of end here and, and thank all of our, um, all the people in the lab that have been working, you know, on the things I described today, including Robin Rabin, Anna Bushman, Ming Li, Ting Yang, Nikolai Candle, um, here describes what they've contributed to, Stephanie Gamis, Michelle Bowie, Jun Lu, our grad students, um, our lab techs, undergrads, all of our collaborators, many of them which are not listed here, the ones in green are the ones I described data for in this talk, including John Marshall, Ethan Beer, Prasad, and Chen Hong, and all of our funders and our lab. And, you know, I want to thank you for your time and let you know that we're, we're hiring. And if any postdocs are interested, please email me. And I'll stop there. Well, th thanks a lot, uh, Omar. That was uh, fantastic. Um, I'm sure everybody really enjoyed it. I know I, I did. Uh, we do have some questions, and we have some time. So why don't we start with some of the some of the questions? Are you ready? Yes. Let me let me. Okay. My... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. So here's a yeah. Here's a question from uh, Michael Monihu up at Johns Hopkins. Uh, it's not hard to imagine pathogens such as Zika and malaria evolving resistance to evade genetic interventions like monoclonal antibodies and microRNAs. What is the anticipated rate of resistance formation in these pathogens, and how does how does it uh, how does that rate uh, at which new interventions could be engineered? How does it compare with the rate at which new interventions could be uh, engineered and approved and deployed? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and I think that kind of um, ties in with one of my last point that there needs to be a lot more work in terms of developing effectors that can block or impair the mosquito's ability to transmit pathogens. And, and to be honest, you know, all the effectors that have been developed so far, including the ones that, you know, prevent plasmodium transmission or dengue or Zika transmission, which I described, have been tested on, on lab strains of, of either the parasite or the, the viruses. And, and, and so it's hard to really know like how, how well those will work out in the field. And I think, you know, next, the, next, the next talk with, by George, you know, I'm sure he's gonna get into this a little more, but what really needs to happen is, is, the, is the next experiment where these effectors are actually tested in the field to see sort of what the rates are and, and how effective they are when challenged against a sort of a, a, a parasite or a virus that's, that's circulating right now in the, in the environment. And the, the big open question is, will, will these actually work? And, 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 and like you said, you know, will there be evolved resistance or natural resistance that's already present? And if so, 
what what's the next step going forward you know and so i think with any population modification type gene drive the this is a big question and i think you have two problems that you have to work on with that with those kinds of systems the first is you know getting the drive to work really well which you know tony described his drive system and it, it seems to work really well it, well enough to to actually make an impact so the next question is how well does the effector work so you have to keep 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 in mind both of those things whereas population suppression drives you really don't need to worry too much about the effector because you're just suppressing the population and and that's also true for pgsit which is why I, I like PGSIT. But, but I think, you know, I don't really have the answer to the question of how, how fast you're gonna get evolution of resistance in the mosquito or the parasite, um, I, I don't know. But I think, I think the experiments need to be done. And I think we're gonna hear more about that next week with George, because I know they're actually gearing up to do some um, tests in Africa in the field to actually test these effectors with a mobile lab. And I'm not sure if he's gonna talk about that, but. I, I do think that's very important in the next step. Great, thanks. Uh, let me just re remind the audience that uh, if you do have questions, please go ahead and, and uh, chat them in and, and we'll get to them as time permits. So there is another question here. Uh, uh, this is from uh, uh, Bascar who says, uh, do, do the gene drive models take genome size into consideration? Fly genomes are much smaller than 80s genomes. And so will the interpretation made based on flies extrapolate to 80s? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't, genome size is not something that's integrated into the model. I mean, really what you're looking at is transmission bias, fitness costs, um, and, and, and just the, the mechanism of how the drive works. Those are the, the things that get in, inputted into the model. Um, it, it could be that genome size is gonna have an impact on, on homing efficiencies, or it could also have an impact on um, the rate at which you get um, mutations in your drive. And, and so you can, you can put in you know, mutation rates into your, into your model. And I think as the genome gets bigger, those rates are gonna uh, potentially you know, change. So you know, I, I think that has been looked at, but in, in general, I think the models that I show are, are in this talk are, are simple and they're just looking at, you know, the rates of transmission bias and fitness costs and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yep, great, thanks. I have another one here for you. Uh, this is from Chris Potter, it's a technical question. In your opinion, is it worthwhile testing guide RNAs with an in vitro DNA digestion assay? Do those test, uh, do those test tube assays accurately predict which guide RNAs will be effective in vivo? Um, that's a great question, Chris. I, I, we do do those in vitro tests on our guide RNAs before we put them in vivo, and, and we do try to choose ones that, that perform well, and the ones that don't perform well, we, we discard. And I, I don't think we've done like a super careful experiment where we you know, meticulously test if there's a real correlation there. Um, but I, I think there is, and I, and I think those in vitro assays are, are very simple and fast that it is, and it's very worth, it is definitely worthwhile to do them and, and try to pick your best guide because in our experience, all guides are not created equal. And, and it, it, is a, it is a feature of the guide. It's not, there's nothing, you know, in some of our experiments, we've carefully controlled for insertion sites and, and we use the same Cas9 and kind of like the experiment I described, um, but you know, one guide worked better than the other and, and, they, and they each have the, the same PAM sequence. So there, there is definitely gonna be, there, there, we don't understand how to, how to pick the best guide still, but I think you wanna try to do whatever quick test you can to test for efficacy and, and vitro assays are the quickest. Cause once you go in vivo, I mean, as you know, it's, it can take you, many months to actually find out if it works or not. So um, I definitely I definitely do recommend to do those in vitro experiments. Yeah, good, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna follow up uh, 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 for Chris on that question and, and ask whether or not, when you showed some differential guide um, effectiveness in, uh, in, in your talk, did did the best guide, I think you remember that slide that you, you mentioned that we actually made this point about guide, guide uh, RNAs performing differently. Did the best one actually uh, prove to be the best one in vitro? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think the, yeah, that's a good question. So in that homework experiment, we chose two guides and and both of them, both of them performed very well in vitro and only, you know, one of them, they both performed in vivo, but one of them performed a lot better. So I, I don't think you can make a direct correlation there. Yeah. But they both, they yeah. both, they both worked in vivo and in vitro, but one worked way better than the other in vivo. So, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh Again, uh, just encouraging the uh, the audience to uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, there's there's no bad questions; they're all good questions. So uh, feel free and please contribute. I have another one here. Uh, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that current genetic approaches in the field, for example, Oxitex, are are not sustainable. Uh, they accomplish similar uh, goal as your uh, PGSIT you described, and. Uh, uh, Siba Das, who is the, the, the uh, questioner here, says, uh, I was curious why you think Oxitec's approach to be not sustainable. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good point. Um, so I, when I talked about being non-sustainable, I brought up Oxitec and also brought up Wolbachia. And, you know, not sustainable, meaning that you have to continuously release the system every generation. So Oxitec has two systems. They have their, their Riddle and their FS Riddle. Um, FS Riddle, you know, enables the release of eggs, whereas Riddle, you have to release adult males. And I think, you know, the fact that you have to sort of release adult males, you know, really limits the scalability of that approach and, and increases the effort, which, which, which makes it, you know, not, not inherently sustainable. Um, I think the FS Riddle with the egg release could actually be more scalable, but still non-sustainable. PGSIT is also not sustainable. It's it's a um, it's an, an approach that you have to release every generation, um, and to 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 you know continue the suppression of the population. So the sustainable type of approach would be you know gene drive, uh, either through population modification or suppression. That would be sustainable. So I mean, I didn't mean to to. I mean, I think Oxitec system is amazing and they've, they've, and I'm not, wasn't trying to say anything bad about it, but I think, you know, you, it, it's not the most scalable system. And I think, you know, we do need more scalable systems and, and PGSIT can be more scalable than Riddle in that you can release eggs. And, and we haven't done that yet, but we're hoping to, to, to test that out and see if that's actually true. Okay, uh, great. Have another one here for you. Uh, this is uh, from Bill Reed at University of Missouri. Uh, do you have any uh, synthetic suggestions for increasing the antipathogen activity of an effector uh, for uh, a heterozygote or in a heterozygote? Yeah, I mean, um, that was kind of an unexpected result in our experiments that the heterozygotes didn't perform as well. And it probably is a virtue of the fact that they don't, they express half as much of the protein um, or the microRNA. And so, you know, I, I think going forward, um, what we're hoping to do is, is, I kind of alluded to this in the end, we have a, um, a system that we published on recently and using CRISPR RNA targeting systems um, that can, uh, in flies, we demonstrated the efficacy of these approaches. And what we found was they have this inherent ability to do this collateral off targeting. So in the presence, only in the presence of their target RNA, do they have this collateral off, off targeting effect. And in flies, the outcome was complete lethality. So even targeting phenotypic genes led to complete lethality in flies. So what we're hoping to do in the mosquito is, is we're actually calling this kind of like a Trojan horse approach, where we, ex we express the system in the mosquito, so the CRISPR RNA targeting system with guides that target viruses um, in, a, in a multiplexed way. And then, you know, the system will, will, will remain in the, in the organism. And, and then in the presence of the virus, we're hoping that, you know, the, um, the system will become activated, it will target the virus, it will lead to collateral off targeting and potentially either reduce the longevity or kill the mosquito. And, and we're, you know, in flies as a heterozygote, that worked quite well. So I'm hopeful that it may perform the same in the mosquito. And the CRISPR RNA targeting system comes from bacteria. It worked well in flies. I don't see why it won't work in mosquito. 
And so we're we're building those systems now and and and, and testing them. So I think I think that's our next approach. And I think killing the mosquito is probably the best outcome, right? If you kill it, then it can't transmit, or you or you kill it before it can transmit. That's that's really the best outcome. And so that's why we're calling it a Trojan horse. It sits there until the virus comes in and then it turns on. So that's what we're working on now. I don't I don't have any data to show you on that, but I think that's what we're that's what we're thinking going forward. Yeah, super interesting. Here's a question for you. How do you how do you weigh uh, this is from Yume Dong. How do you weigh two different approach the two different approaches, uh, population modification versus population suppression? Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, I I think they both have their advantages and disadvantages, to be honest with you. I think um, I like population modification better, in my opinion, just because of the um, you know, I think the systems that have been developed work really well, you know, in, in Tony James's uh, hands in mosquitoes, um, for example, they, and, and also in, in our experiments too, in flies, you know, they, they work pretty well. You can, they can replace populations. Um, I think, and, and because it's gonna persist out there, it's, it's unlikely to, um, to really go away. And, and as long as your effector works and, it, you know, the, this, everything should be fine. I think with population suppression, there's there's a couple papers out there that show that you get these waves, right? You you if it really works well, you get population suppression, and then you get a wave. Then you know the population declines, and then then wild types come back in and and sort of reinvade and start a new population. So you have to keep releasing, and and then you're also putting a pretty strong selective pressure to evolve resistance to the drive mechanism because you either evolve resistance or you're dead, you know? And so I, I think that creates a, a very strong bottleneck that's gonna potentially select for resistance. And, and if resistance happens, then the system is going to, to fail. So I, I kind of, I, I think population modification may work better, but I mean, time will tell. I think, I think the real test is gonna be um, how do they perform in the field? And in general, I think people, if you ask two different people, I think both of them are gonna agree that they would rather just get rid of mosquitoes altogether, right? Nobody likes to get bit by a mosquito. So if you just got rid of them, I think that's the best outcome. But um, I, think, I think population modification has, has a better chance at actually, um, actually working in the field, in, in my opinion. But I mean, let's see what the data shows when, we, when, when field trials start in the, in sometime in the future, when these things become, you know, regulatable and public approves them and, you know, uh, and they're safe. I think, I think once we get that, that data, then that'll tell us which one actually is better, but either outcome would be great, right? If you got rid of the, you know, all the malaria vectors, the, the main ones, that'd be great, right? If you prevent all of them from transmitting, that's also great. You know, I think either outcome is, is desirable, but I kind of, I'm leaning towards population modification a bit. Okay, great. Uh, Aaron Roberts uh, says, uh, hi, Omar, and thanks very much for your presentation. Which field tests in Africa did you refer to a moment ago? Um, which field tests? So uh, I might have misspoke, but there, there is no field test going on for gene drives that, that I know about right now yeah. in Africa. So I'm, I'm not sure what he's referring to, actually. Yeah. Yeah, Aaron, if you're if you're out there and you want to clarify that, go ahead and text, uh, chat it in, and we can we can uh, we can we can follow up on that for sure. Uh, here's one from Sampath Kumar: uh, Can homing be affected if assortative mating behavior is uh, is expressed among transgenic mosquitoes? Yeah, I mean, it, if if you have assortative mating, and and for example, if if you're um, let's say your, your wild mosquitoes can recognize the gene drive mosquitoes or the lab reared mosquitoes and decide not to mate with them. Um, and can, ex you know, that, that would have, that would affect your transmission ability, right? Because the assumption is that when you release them, they're going to mate, you know, as well as wild type males in the population and they're going to spread these, these, um, these gene drives. But if, if they don't mate with the wild population, then they're not going to spread. So, I think assortative mating is something that that 
that could have a, a big outcome. And so, again, I think in order to test those things, you need to actually do the experiment and see if there is, you know, you, you, you take a field site, you, you have a wild population there, you release them, and then you monitor and, and you look to see if how well it's spreading. And if, and if it's not spreading, then you kind of try to figure out why. And the sort of mating could definitely be one of the, a problem that could, that, that could happen. But um, it's hard to test that in the lab really because you know you have lab strains and they perform they perform well against lab strains so um i think the, the real test would be ch to challenge them against wild strains in the lab and then also in the field um in cage studies and, and maybe open releases eventually right but i think until you do those experiments you, you don't really know um yeah that's my answer okay I'm, I'm going to jump down to uh, to Aaron Roberts' uh, follow up since uh, since uh, I asked him to, to so to clarify Omar, uh, he was aware they were getting up uh, for some gene drive system field tests in Africa, right after referring to the work of Anthony James. Not sure if, if it was Anthony James's lab he was referring to or some other group. I mean. I yeah. So just to clarify, I mean, there, there is no field trials of gene drives going on right now. And, and there has, there's never been one. Um, that doesn't mean in the future, at some point in the future that they may happen. And that's going to depend on a lot of things. And, um, and, and in my opinion, I think the, the first kind of field test that should happen um, should be something that's confinable and safe. And that's why, you know, our lab is building confinable drives like split drives and that would enable sort of, um, you know, that would enable safe, confinable tests. And, and, and if something were to go awry, you could easily reverse it um, through, through release of wild type alleles. And so I think that should be like, you know, the first priority for a field test should be a confinable type drive system, like what I've, what I've, what I've talked about here. Um, but yeah, just to be clear, there, there is no, um, as far as I know, there are no field trials that are that are being done right now, um, or or even planned. I mean, I mean, people would like to do them eventually, but of course, there's going to be um, a lot of things that need to happen, right? You need to get regulatory approval. You need to get public acceptance. You need to prove that they're safe, that they're effective, that your effector works. There's there's a number of things that, and we we've, we've described all those things in some of our like the paper that I that I um, posted in my talk um, that that talks about the the effectors um, with John Marshall. I think that that's a paper you can look at that talks about some of those issues. Um, but yeah, so yeah, just to be clear, there's there's no, no field trials happening right now. Yeah, definitely. Now I start to can, can confirm that as well. Uh, so uh, Max Scott down at uh, North Carolina State has a question. Is the next step for PGSIT field cage studies like the Gates program did in Mexico that uh, Tony, Tony James was involved in a number of years ago or open field trials uh, like Oxitec had done? That's a good question. So, um, you know, PGSIT, you know, we originally designed it and built it in flies and, and published that in Drosophila melanogaster, but we followed up on that work and we've built it in another fruit fly called Drosophila Suzuki, which is a, a major crop pest in, in, in the world and also in California. It affects cherries, blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, um, and and so we've developed it there, and, and we've um, we actually have approval right now to do a field trial in Oregon, um, a cage field trial. So we're doing a we're we're gearing up for a cage trial of that system, and and the, and and then the results from that will will lead into sort of, you know a, a, an application for a permit for kind of an open trial in a field. Um, and then if those go well, then I think we'll continue on to, to more broad, uh, you know, broad applications. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the path forward that, I, that I'm thinking, you know, um, you know, I think you want to, you want to test it, testing it in a cage, you know, will, will definitely show that it's effective. And I think that that's the first test and whether that's in a lab or in the field, I think, um, and the field is probably better because you actually will have environmental conditions that are changing and, and you can see how effective it is there. So, so I, yeah, we think of it as a steps, you know, a phased approach, first a lab, then a cage, then, then kind of a semi field. And maybe if everything goes well and it's safe and effective and, and go to, to more wide scale uh, distribution and testing. 
That's a good question. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, I have a question here that I think uh, refers back to some uh, some of the discussion uh, in your discussion about uh, uh, suppression versus uh, uh, versus replacement. And this is from uh, Maggie Hunter. She says, "How do you counter the argument that mosquitoes are integrated into ecosystem food webs?" Um. Yeah. I mean. I think, so I guess the, the argument that is being made is that mosquitoes are essential for something. They're integrated into the food web. And, and that's true. I think, I think in general, like, you know, mosquitoes are important and, and they, they serve as a food source towards aquatic insects. And, and there's, there's papers showing that bats feed on them. And so I think if you removed all mosquitoes from earth like through population suppression, you, there probably would be a significant environmental outcome. I agree with that. But I think the, to clarify, we're actually talking about just a handful of, of mosquito vectors that are transmitting pathogens. So for dengue, Zika, chikungunya, yellow fever, those viruses, those are transmitted by primarily two mosquito vectors, Aedes aegyptus and Aedes aegypti. So if you just remove those two vectors, you would remove almost all of the transmission of those pathogens, right? So I think just removing those two vectors wouldn't have such a, a, a a big outcome, mainly because they're they're invasive, right? Like both of those vectors are present in California. I was actually getting bit yesterday in my backyard by Aedes aegypti, which is super annoying. But it got it came to California in, in 2011, I believe. You know, Greg Lanzaro has done a lot of work on on tracking when it when it got here and how it spread. But you know, it, it's here now. It's it's invasive. It, it, you know, it wasn't here prior to 2011. And, and now that it's here, if, if you were to go and remove it, I don't, I don't think it's gonna have a big outcome, right? A big impact. So I think the argument is that, you know, these invasive insects, if you remove them, you know, there's, there's not really a niche there. But, but yeah, if you removed all insects off earth, there would, be, there would be an outcome. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about just targeting a few vectors. Anopheles gambi, Anopheles stevensi, Aedes aegypti, Aedes elopictus, maybe, Anopheles arabiensis, a few other Anopheles vectors. I mean, those are what people are, Culex, Culex, Culex Q, that's what people are talking about. Um, so that's the counter, I think. Thank you. Good. Well, uh, we're just about out of time and we, we are uh, out of questions and that's, uh, that's good. And Maggie says, thank you for, for the answer to that. So uh, if everyone will join me in uh, thanking uh, Omar for his great presentation. All right. Thank so, you so on much. on that note, uh, yeah. Th so, uh, thanks, Omar, so very much. And uh, as we wrap up today's uh, webinar, I just like to remind everybody that uh, this series will continue at the same time and place uh, next week. And uh, as as Omar had uh, mentioned, our speaker will be George Christofides, and he'll be talking about uh, the title of his talk is "Transmission Zero: Converting Malaria Mosquito Vectors into Non-Vectors Via Minimal Genetic Modifications." And I encourage everybody to uh, register for that and, and show up. I'm sure it's going to be an excellent talk and uh, as, as this one has and the ones prior to this have. So with that, I'll say uh, thanks again to Omar. Uh, thank you for attending the webinar today. Thank you to Tara and Dietria for uh, the back end technical aspects. Thanks to uh, Hector Kamada, my wingman on this. And, uh, and thank you again, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>